hey booktube it's Peg at the history shelf um, before I jump into the, today's video uh, following up on a book I read for nonfiction November first of all I didn't make a video yesterday but um, yesterday was Veterans Day and I want to personally send a shout out to all my uh, fellow veterans out there um, I am former Air Force so woo, so happy Veterans Day uh, to um, anyone who has served or is serving um, I just want to say thank you for your service and that um, it means a lot to me and I know it means a lot to many, many Americans out there. So anyway, it's a belated Happy Veterans Day. Okay, so the book I finished reading was a great idea at the time, The Rise, Fall, and Curious Afterlife of the Great Books. And this is by Alex Beam. So this was a really fun read. It was, I just flew through it. Um, it's about 200 pages. And I uh, learned a little bit more about the, the author. He, he writes for the Boston Globe, or he did at the time that this book was written, which was about uh, 10 or 11 years ago. It came out in 2008. And here's the author, Alex Beam. Um, but yeah, he has uh, he's written for New York Times, Slate, The Atlantic, but uh, he's supposed to be a columnist for the Boston Globe. I don't know if he still is. Anyway is very humorously written, is very uh, colloquial, very informal, lots of humor involved. But basically this book follows the uh, the creation of the great books of the Western world uh, series back in the um, the, uh, it's the 50s, I think it came out in 52. And uh, we learned a lot about the two, the, the, the main two architects uh, of the great books, which was Robert Hutchins, and Mortimer Adler, and I'm sure a lot of you may not know the first, but you know the second name. Uh, Mortimer Adler wrote that famous book, and I have it, but I cannot find it upstairs. I just went looking for it to show you guys, but it's it's the classic called How to Read a Book, um, and I've read it, and that it's it's helpful in many ways. But uh, a lot of the great courses, um, classes that still exist, that people do have that on the reading list. Um, to, to read how to how to read a book, but anyway, so Robert Hutchins, who was the um, the president of the University of Chicago, when this uh, this idea came along, let me find a picture for you. Um, basically, he kind of came into University of Chicago and uh, looked to overhaul the curriculum, and uh, it had a lot of people kind of stewing and fussing about, you know, are you reintroducing medieval scholasticism and this kind of stuff? Because he believed in the great ideas and the great books. I'm trying to find a picture. This is it's Robert Hutchins. Um, and it, it's just a fascinating story. And then he met up with Mortimer Adler, and I guess Adler completely... Uh, just um, idolized Hutchins, and uh, they both, uh, and Mortimer Adler's a fascinating character. I didn't know much about him personally before I read this book, um, but kind of a, a little bit of a mini uh, phenomenon, I guess. He um, he was extremely smart, and at the a young age, he, he graduated with his PhD at like 18, I think, and um, and it was it's the story just goes on and on from there. There's so many names. There's so much name dropping here. It's fascinating. You come across people like uh, Lionel Trilling, um, uh, Harold Bloom, Alan Bloom, Jacques Barzun, John Erskine. Uh, there's a ton more. I'm just I'm forgetting. There's just a ton more people. John Dewey, who was against the Great Books. Um, curricula you know he didn't believe in it and anyway but basically the book just highlights how they went from um, offering great books courses at the University of Chicago where it would be like a two two hour seminar once a week and uh, the students it was a limited classroom size like the first class had 20 people and everyone was fighting to get in um, and it was the class kind of worked like on the Socratic inquiry um, format so you would have massive amounts of reading from the great the great classics and then you would discuss it in a, in a the two moderators are usually Hutchins and Mortimer Adler um, and uh, they, they started getting um, 
uh, aligned with the uh, like this the salespeople that decided hey you know what this could be a great pit we why not print these books for all of you know general readership and um, so it turned into a, a mass marketing type of event where it went from curricula at the University of Chicago into a publishing venture um, via William Benton who was a, a famous ad man of the time I guess he was a genius at what he did and um, they just made it into a full-blown you know ad campaign to sell these sets of 54 books to people claiming that oh you know for any issue in life if you need to know what the great minds thought about justice you know and the syntop syntopicon is what they created a two volume massive index of sorts to show you whoever whatever topic there was they cross-referenced it to all of the the great writers and it was as this book points out it was just it was diabolically stupid um there's the syntopicon there's these two volumes that was supposed to provide a, a reference for you for all of these books uh pertaining to just the right you know whatever thought or or angle or virtue you're looking at the syntopicon can guide you to all of the the, the great books um so uh it had it had you know it's 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 as the book says, the rise, fall, and curious afterlife. Um, at one point, you know, in the beginning year, they didn't make very much money. They didn't sell many sets, and then this guy just did this huge ad campaign, and it just it became very famous. At the time, people could buy a set for anywhere between like three to four hundred dollars in the fifties and sixties. Um, the writer himself said he grew up with that. You know, he had the set in his house and. It, this was a fun book. It was just a fun book to see how academia responded to the the great books, and the, the, there were the haters, there were the supporters, there were the in betweens, and um, and the writer's very Alex Beam is very um, he, he has a nice equilibrium about him uh, when it comes to the topic. He you know he's not a hater, he's not a lover. He's just a very like any like a journalist. You know he's a he's just reporting it objectively. But at the end, I wanted to read to you this, this one portion because I really, I think it kind of sums it up. Because he, in this part, he's talking about how a lot of people poked fun at the great books, you know, and the whole idea of it. And he says, it is hard to resist poking fun. And yet, about two-thirds of the way through my research, I found myself occasionally succumbing to creeping great booksism almost like a low-level staph infection that invaded my metabolism. When my local library reading group assigned Aristophanes Lysistrata, I embarked on what my mother would call a jag, reading three or four of the playwright's hilarious, body, wildly disjointed, and awfully translated plays in a row. On a whim, I picked up a copy of John Stuart Mill's autobiography, the book that convinced Mortimer Adler that he was wasting his time scribbling for the New York Sun and prompted him to apply to Columbia. It did not convince me to stop scribbling for a living, but I read most of it and enjoyed what I read. Adler seized on Mill's astonishing education, but I was seduced by Mill's zen-like conclusion that erudition can't buy you love, or in his case, happiness. Quote, Those only are happy, Mill wrote, who have their minds fixed on some object other than their own happiness. Uh, so I just thought I just liked that, and that was a great quote. And then, um, so he kind of, you know, and then it goes into a little bit more of reminiscing in his conclusion about, you know, what he learned from studying Homer, Plato, Socrates, um, and what all these other people got out of it. And it goes to show that, you know, as the great books, you know, really can't be static, but you can't really throw out the people who have come before as well. So um, it's like some of these names will always be there, and there's a reason. Um, here we go. Um, Plato, Aristotle, um, Herodotus, Thucydides, Aquinas, Augustine, Descartes, Dante, Shakespeare, Flaubert, Goethe, Milton, Locke, Rousseau, Machiavelli, Mill. You know, their names keep coming up is what he says, and there's a reason for that. And... Uh, and by all means, we will always have new great books and new writers from 
all different cultures. And uh, so, you know, it's, as he says here at the end, you, you keep finding these books. They, they, they have a way of surviving. Um, and he says they are everywhere. The great books are dead. Long live the great books. So I, I just, I like that ending. Kind of like the, uh, the king is dead. Long live the king and all this kind of stuff. So or the queen is dead. So. Um, anyway, it was a fun book. And, you know, I have the other book that I, I picked up based off Hannah's suggestion. Let me grab it. I'm back, sorry. <laughs> Um, so this is the other book. This is the whole five feet, and this is a personal, another like a personal memoir of someone who actually um, went through it. And I had forgotten to tell you there was a blurb on the front by one of my favorite writers, Joyce Carol Oates, and she says a unique memoir, intimate, conf confiding, and deeply moving. So now that I finished this book, which I really enjoyed, um, I wanted to I want to take on this one and just see what this person really thought about the books. And another aspect of the great books, which I, I may have mentioned before in one of my other videos, talking about this book, um, I own a couple of used copies. They're deep in storage, but they are they, they were un, horribly unreadable. And they still are. Um, they were printed in eight-point type, double-columned on each page, and just so dense. And then another thing that the, the book points out is the uh, there was the um, the whole argument over why are we including these arcane scientific texts that no one will read or understand? Not even the 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 faculty could understand some of these works by like ancient Greek um, you know mathematicians. And it was just like why are we printing a whole book up on you know Epicurus's or is it Epicurus? No, Euclid. Sorry, Euclid's geometry and something else that was even more unheard of. So, I mean, they made some really weird choices in the uh, the Great Books uh, selection. And, of course, the, it was very subjective. It was just a bunch of professors at, uh, that, they, that they impaneled to, um, you know, uh, bring forth their ideas of what were the Great Books. And, of course, they were mostly all men, uh, white men. And um, so they had a redo in the 90s where they reissued the great books, and then they finally included some women. <laughs> you know, I think, I think the first set in the 50s, they didn't have any women. And then so the, the new set in the 90s had, like, Wolf, um, uh, Cather, Willa Cather, um, a couple others, and then a, a couple, maybe one book by a person of, uh, like, African-American descent. So... I think it was W.E.B. Du Bois's uh, Souls of Black Folk. So, but uh, I guess, so the afterlife is there are still some great books, programs that meet. They're very tiny. They meet in a couple of different cities or they're online now. And, um, and I didn't realize it at the time, but I had heard a, a podcast that had referenced the great books and you could you could sign up and, and I did for a little while I didn't realize it was part of this uh, legacy um, but it's the great books online and it was like 60 bucks a month to uh, they would ship you the book so basically I started off with the Iliad and the Odyssey and uh, 60 bucks a month and you signed up to attend like a, a monthly seminar or a bi-weekly seminar, I forget, and you would have discussions. Um, but I was still busy with school, and I realized I had taken on a class at the time that I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't give my full attention to. So I had to, you know, hit pause on that. And the person who ran the thing said, "Come back whenever you you, you can," you know. But I think the next book we were going to study was Plato. So I think it was a, you know, and so I think they they had the Great Books affiliation, although it was a different logo, but still. It's interesting. I think it behooves us to read the classics, knowing that the classics will evolve, but not throwing out what's come before. I'm a firm believer in that. I, I, I don't think that, um, you know, the ideas that uh, have, have rooted and grounded our, our civilization, at least Western civilization, are, uh, you know, um, barren of worth I there's something to them 
there's a lot to them. Um, and we're the beneficiaries of it, you know, that we can sit here and I can sit here and talk to you and share my thoughts and I'm not censored, at least not yet. <laughs> um, I can tell you how I feel about something and what I think and, and you can dialogue back with me. We can disagree and, um, you know, it's, it's because we have a free society that we can do that and a civilizational, you know, groundwork that encourages dialogue. And, um, you know, I go all the way back to the, um, uh, the Agora in, in ancient Greece and where there was a free flow of ideas and people were loved talking about ideas and thinking. So I don't know, you guys, I'm just going off on a little bit of a tangent here. But so while the great books of the Western world were very limited in scope, obviously, and uh, some of it was just completely unreadable. I think the intent was good. Um, but this book was such an enjoyable, fun read. I highly recommend it, you guys, if you can find it at your library. It's, it's funny. It's, uh, it's relaxed. And you just kind of breeze through. And, uh, you know, you get to, to meet a few more people that you, you never heard of. So, Anyway, that is my take on uh, one of my nonfiction November titles. I'm glad I read it. I'm glad you guys chose it for me. And uh, I think very soon I'll try to dip into the whole five feet and uh, see how this fills out my understanding from this book. And this one is by Christopher Beha. Thank you, Hannah, for the uh, recommendation there on that one. Okay, you guys, so I think I'm going to keep this one, uh, whoop, 16 minutes anyway. I really appreciate um, your time. Thank you for all the new subscribers. Thank you for watching this video. Please let me know what you think in the comments below. And I'll talk to you guys soon. All right? Take care. Bye.